Wait a second. And I can watch. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to today's SASIC hosted GeoTalk. Our guest speaker for today is Professor Bruce Kerncross, who will be presenting his talk on the Kalahari manganese field and its remarkable minerals. Professor Bruce Kerncross obtained his MSc from the University of Natal in 1979 and PhD in 1986 from the University of the Witwatersrand. He then joined Rand Afrikaans University's geology department where he served as head of department from 2003 to 2016. He is now Emeritus Professor of Geology at the University of Johannesburg. Bruce has written 12 books on South African minerals and gemstones, authored and co-authored over 200 articles and presented numerous public lectures on the same topics. He is highly regarded for his mineral and gemstone photography and has won local and international awards for his work. He was awarded the GSSA's Presidential Award in 2009 for services rendered to the Johannesburg Geological Museum and South African Mineral Heritage. In 2020, he was honored with the GSSA's Draper Medal for lifetime achievements and contribution to South African geology, geoheritage, and tertiary education. In January 2023, the Canadian Mineralogical Association awarded Professor Karen Cross the Pinch Medal for major and sustained contributions to the advancement of mineralogy. The mineral Karen Cross site discovered in the Kalahari manganese field is named in his honor. As the SASEC 2023 president, it is my honor to welcome Professor Karen Cross here today. Question. Right. Well, David, thanks for that introduction. Um, sorry, let's just click on the screen. Okay. There we go. Okay. So, so you can use the arrow. You can use the arrow. Or the mouse. Or the mouse. Or the mouse if you can you click once on the on the right? No. So you think it's easier to use the keys? Okay. Well, okay. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thanks for that introduction. And um, as you can see, I'm going to be talking today on the Kalahari manganese field and their minerals. Um, so without further ado, um, we can get going with the talk. I would like to, have, first of all, acknowledge a few people and also tell you something. I have to um, admit to something. Um, you might know there's a an, an, international, an international institution that um, helps people who are addicted. And often they have these get togethers and a person stands up in front of them and they admit something to the group. So I have to admit something to you today. Um, I am actually a cold geologist, a sedimentologist, but I'm addicted to minerals. And um, in the sense that I'm, I'm not a crystallographer and I'm not a professional mineralogist, but I have an interest in minerals and I've been collecting minerals for 48 years, starting as a student, a second year student. Um, and some of the work I've done, and especially in the Kalahari manganese field, um, I've collaborated with people who know a lot more about the geology um, and the genesis of the deposit than I do. And in fact, this particular photo here, which was taken 27 years ago, it's in uh, the front cover of our book there, um, shows two of the people who, for the Kalahari geology and mineralogy, um, I am indebted to. On the, the right hand side there is Jens Gutzma, who used to be at Rao UJ. And on the left is the late Nick Birkus. And Nick, really is well known internationally for, for uh, unraveling the geology of the iron and the manganese deposits. And Jens, um, 
he worked on his, his PhD on the mineralogy and a lot of the mineralogy and the genesis of the ores there, um, he unraveled. And in fact, this book, the manganese book, which you might know about, and the second one, the first part of the book, the geology, they really did. I did the second half, which is on the minerals. So I'm, I have to acknowledge the two of them. And then sitting in the front here is Desmond Sacker, who was now the retired chairman of ASSEL, this company here, who together with S. Mang, um, own some of the manganese mines now still today in the Kalari manganese field. And it was he who suggested to me over 30 years ago, why don't you do a book on the minerals and the geology of the Kalari manganese field? And so the three of us got together and we did that book. You can see the cover there. Um, and his company paid for the book, the publishing, the production costs, the field work, everything. And also the second edition as well. Um, so um, to acknowledge and to say thanks to those three gentlemen in particular. Who's the guy in the painting? The guy in the painting is Desmond Sacco's father, whose name is Guidaco, and I'll talk about him in a while, because the Sacco's are instrumental in unraveling the history of the Kalahari manganese field. I'd also just obviously like to acknowledge the source of my funding over the years, uh, Samira, some of you may know about the Center of Excellence and the National Research Foundation who um, provided my funding in the past. So what I want to do today in the time available uh, is talk briefly about the history and the geology, how the deposit was discovered, and then spend the rest of the time looking at the minerals, because that's my interest. Famous minerals, some weird and rare minerals, and then what has happened there in the last 20 years, the 21st century. And then I thought I would end by having a discussion and showing you some of the type minerals. In other words, the minerals that were discovered in the Kalahari manganese field, for which it is world famous. Um, and then just have a short conclusion. So without further ado, in case you don't know where the Kalahari manganese field is, it's situated here in the hinterland of South Africa in the Northern Cape province. And you can see um, it's pretty far away from the coastline, from any harbors. If you're mining iron, or, or iron and or manganese ore, you want to ship it to the coastline. And in the early days, that was a problem, the access. Um, but that has now obviously been solved. But that's the locality. That's where you find it geographically. Logically. It's in the Transvaal supergroup. So let's look a little bit um, at the history. My talk is sort of geo heritage. Um, it's not high powered geology. So if there are students here, you don't have to, I'm not going to be talking about isotopes and such like. So if we look at the history, this map, uh, which shows you Griqualand West, was drawn in 1872. By, by Francis Orpen, his name down here. And it says the geology added by Geo Stowe. So it's a bit hard, it's a, it's a very old map. But if you look at this northwestern part of the map up here, um, it's almost illegible. But down here, this is where the town of Postmusburg is. And there's a little hill here, and on this map, it's reading Blinklip Kop, shiny. Stone Hill, direct translation. And that's basically a hill just outside of Postmusburg that is composed of hematite. And uh, I'll talk a bit about that in a while. But if you just come up here, here's a road that says to Kuruman. And Kuruman was already a town established. It was a mission station in the, in the 1800s. Um, so this is the first map that uh, was drawn for the area. If we um, go forward up to 1907 and we go north, this is Rogers's map. And uh, that Blinklip Kop and Postmusburg is down here. But there's the town of Kuruman. And for the first time, there's a little blip here which says, I can read it for you, Black Rock Hill. Black Rock Hill. And that's the outcrop of the iron and the manganese ore body in the Kalahari manganese field. And Rogers was the first one to actually 
plotted on a map. So it's the first time it was shown actually on the on the geology of the region. Um, they recognized that there was iron ore there in the sediments, um, but the fact that there was manganese wasn't really at this time period really recognized and it wasn't thought to have any great value. So if we just look at a few timelines, there's lots of events that happened, but I thought I'd just take a few. I think it's important to mention that uh, that Blinklip Cook, that shiny stone hill, was already exploited AD 800, AD 1200 by the Khoisan. And archaeological evidence shows that it was worked even up to 2000 BC. And it was worked by the indigenous people for Sobilo or okra, which is the, the red, waxy, oily iron powder that was used for personal adornment. And uh, so long before the Europeans came along, hundreds of years, even thousands of years before, these outcrops were known. And so they were, if you like, rediscovered in the 1800s. Because if you go into the 1800s, the, then the Europeans arrived, virtual Liechtenstein. In fact, Birchall gives a very detailed description in 1812 when he was there of the diggings that were still active in that hill, in the caves that had been actually dug out. And as I say, that's the first map. Then in the early 1900s, that's when Black Rock first appeared. And then, but nothing was going on in the Kalahari Manganese field. All of the activity was further south in Posmosburg, because that's where they knew there was iron ore, because it had been discovered earlier. Um, and so there was exploration and early mining had started there. But And Hall's paper, A.L. Hall, published a paper in 1923 in the Transactions of the Geological Society, um, but on Posmosburg. But then, in 1928, you asked who was in the painting. A young Italian geologist came over from Italy. He could speak hardly any English. Um, but he came here for wealth and fame, I suppose. And um, he went down to Portsmouthburg and he formed the Gloucester Manganese Mines Company in Portsmouthburg. And more or less at the same time, the Iron and Steel Corporation was formed, but still down in Portsmouthburg. But then the exploration, because they knew this ore body and it was going along strike. And so exploration then expanded out to the north and the east and the west. But the problem was most of the area is covered by the Kalahari sand. So that Black Rock Hill is the only outcrop where you can see any of the geology. And so Guido Sacco went up there as a geologist, mapped the area, and he saw the potential in the outcrop of the iron and the manganese ore. And he he then founded, via the company they had already in Portsmouthburg, he opened the Black Rock Mine in 1940. And that was the beginning of mining in the Kalahari Manganese field, which is still going on today. So that's just some early history on the discovery. If we're looking at the minerals, and I'll show you all of these, um, the first rhodochrosites, that's a manganese carbonate uh, mineral, it's one of these very really attractive minerals, well, it was found in 1963 at the Hottersell mine. Now, Hottersell is the name of the one mine there, and it's a play on words, Hottersell, because it is in the summer, if you go there, maybe you've been there, you'll know that. But then shortly thereafter, the other mines opened, the Mamatuan mine, and then the Nshwaning one, two, and three mines, and the Vessels mine. But up until the early 2000s, there were only really these two companies who were in the Kalahari Manganese field. That is Asma and Samanko, S.A. Manganese. But then in the early 2000s, 2002, with the promulgation of the new act, the Minerals Act, um, the mineral rights was actually opened up and a lot more companies then became involved and are actually involved today in the exploitation of the ore body. So here's um, just a couple of historical slides of some of the old mines. That's the Devon mine, an open cast mine. Some of the mines are open cast and some are underground, 1957. And that's the Adams mine, 1961. They sort of further south in the Kalahari manganese field. Okay, so this is the first detailed geological map of that Black Rock Hill. But here's just a quote, Rogers, that map I showed you, 1907, where he says about seven miles uh, from the upper Dikfatong on the road to Koranabach, the mountains, there's a remarkable black copy hill 
projecting from the sand to a height of some 80 feet. The hill is called the Black Rock. Now, if you look at Boardman's map, there are three farm names here, Santoy, Belgravia, and Njuaning. That's the name of the farms. And they meet, the triple point boundary of the farms meet on the beacon here on the Black Rock Hill. And just from the colors, Boardman's map, the black lines you see here, the solid black is the hematite uh, ores, that's the banded iron formations. And these um, diagonal lines are the layers or the beds of the manganese ore. So they were actually exposed in this outcrop of the Black Rock Hill. So the next slide I'll show you is gonna be a view looking from the east towards the west. So that's what it looked like at the time. There's an old farmhouse here. There's the hill. It doesn't look very impressive, actually. It's quite low lying. And here it is in more recent times. Okay, And you can see that obviously the mine has already developed there. And there's some reservoirs, for example, up on the hill. Um, is there a way to clear this at the top? It's already uh, go out. Sorry about that. Is it going to be a problem? No, no, no. take it away. Thank you. Why. You can just open it and close it again. Okay. 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 All right. This is quite a bit of a busy slide, but it's showing you a couple of things. First of all, there's a there's a date along the top here, 1935. This is from our from our second book, so it does need to be updated, but it's still fairly relevant now. And it shows you all the mines that are operating there up till 2015, and it shows you whether they are open cast mines, the grey dots, or whether they are underground. Some are both. For example, Black Rock Mine was both. And then the company involved who owns the mines. And you can see, as I said, Samancor and Asmang, those are the only two real mines until the new order mineral rights came out. And then we start seeing post 2004, five, uh, some of the other companies, Khalakhadi, Chapizu, et cetera. Um, and this shows when the mine opened um, and when the mine opened and when it closed. So you can see quite a few of these mines are closed. Some are still mining. So the Hotazel mine, which is closed, but there's a new mine open right next door now. The Entwining and the Vessels mine, Entwining 2 and Entwining 3. And those are the main mines that, from a mineral standpoint, specimen standpoint, that really have produced the minerals that are quite famous. Now, the other thing that's on here is the color, the red and the blue. And the blue is showing low grade manganese ore and the red high grade. So there's two different types of ore in the Kalahari manganese field. And obviously the mines would like to mine the high grade ore. Um, and you can see these mines, the current mines that I've got circled here are mining the high grade ore. So um, what is the difference? Well, the low grade ore, what's called sometimes the Mamatuan type ore after the Mamatuan mine, has got about 30 to 38 weight percent of manganese in it, low grade. And that's the original sedimentary ore that was deposited at the time of deposition of the sediments in the Paleoproterozoic. So it's the primary ore, if you like. But then the high grade ore, which is being called by Gutzma the vessel type ore, carries a higher percentage, higher grade ore. It's got 42 to 60 weight percent of manganese. And that's basically, and I'll show you how this happened. The lower grade ore, which was originally there from the beginning, has been upgraded to higher grade ore by various hydrothermal and supergene processes. And in case you didn't know, the Kalahari manganese field is the largest uh, resource of manganese, land-based manganese in the world, by far. Um, up to, I think it's now maybe 78% of the manganese. There's also manganese on the seafloor, on the ocean seafloors, um, and they, there is some mining going on, but it's it's not yet important. So we have the biggest deposit of manganese in the world. So yes, a this is a map of all of the farms in the Kalahari manganese field, and this um, red line you see here is outlining this whole area here is low grade ore, and way down south there there is Mama Twine. So right in the southern part. Of the Kalahari manganese field is the Mamatuan mine. And up here in the north, this is a zone of high grade ore. And there's a little pocket that you see here on the side as well. Okay. And then the different colors here are just showing you um, the different 
companies that are now involved. So you can see there's far more low-grade ore than there is high-grade ore. So it's quite competitive if you try to find high-grade ore. So next slide I'll show you is a Google Earth image looking from the southeast towards the northwest. So here you see, so this is the open cast. There's the Mama Twine mine. There's the, there's the Adams mine. And going up towards the north past Smart, the UNK mine, Perth, here's the Twining mines and the vessels. And there's the Black Rock. You can just see it there. So if we zoom in up here to look at these mines, there you can see there's the Black Rock. There's the vessels mine. This is the entwining mine. The headgear is here, and the old decline for entwining one is here. And entwining three headgear is over here. And there's the black rock mine here. And you can see the evidence of the manganese from the black in the, in the Google Earth image. So, okay, if you have been there, if you haven't, the road to Kuruman, this is going up from Kuruman to Hotazel. It's very featureless, it's flat. And it's dry. This is basically Kalahari sand. There's, as you can see, there's no outcrop at all. So just think if you were there in 1920 as a young Italian geologist exploration, and you didn't have that little black hill, you wouldn't know what was going on yet, probably until geophysics came along a lot later. So that's it's dry. It's a semi-arid climate. Not always. This is 2008, um, Paul Ballier, a photograph of the Nchwaning mine with heavy rainfall. And I think they had quite heavy rain there fairly recently as well. And it's not always dry. This is shortly after the rains in 2008. So, you know, that can change their climatic. Some slides. This is the, um, the Mama Twan mine. So it's mining the low grade ore. So it's an open pit mine and they mine a lot of tonnages because it's a lower grade ore. This is the Gloria mine, which mines uh, the higher grade ore further to the north. And here's Black Rock, the view from an airplane. So you can see, again, it's, it's not uh, huge, but it's the only thing sticking out within 60 kilometers radius. So it's very obvious, if you like. Why didn't they take that out? They did. Oh. Uh, and I'll show you right now. The next slide, if you just look at this hill, there's some, it looks like entrance to a cave, but that's an adit going down into, into the ore body. So the next slide, is if you walk down there, it looks like this. So here's a man for scale, okay? And these are the support pillars, okay? So this is the Black Rock Mine that they opened in 1940 and it closed in about 19, 1975. So you can see, actually, you can see here you can, that the strata are dipping quite steeply towards the west. So that's what this mine looked like. They did open cast it a bit, but then they went underground. So, but they didn't remove the whole hill because it wasn't all ore body. You know, there was, there, there, there was the sufficient cover as well. So let's look a little bit at the geology. And again, courtesy of Jens Gutzma and also Nick Bierkes. Um, okay, this is a vertical column and there's a scale that is 20 meters. So this is probably about 120, 150 meters. And down below here in green is the Ongeluk lavas. Above here in blue is the Moidrai formation, which is basically dolomites and limestones. You can see the description of the lithologies on the side here. Yeah? And in between is what's uh, lithostratigraphically the hot as hell formation. And it's the hot as hell formation that contains the manganese ore. Um, and again, Gutzma and Birkus have got the different types of yeah, hematite, lutite, brownite, lutite. Lutite is basically a mudstone. And on the right-hand side here, I've just added in, these are some core samples, just to show you what some of these rocks actually look like. So down here, this is a jasper light. So this is the Ironrich Church, for example. And up here are some of the dolomites, the stromatolytic dolomite, for example. So just to give you a feel, this, these core samples are about uh, four centimeters wide. So there, there are three main ore bodies, the MN1 and these two small ones, MN2 and 3. That, this is the ore body that they mine at Hotazel and the Nshwaning mine, the main one. So here's a cross section from east to west um, through the area. So the Nshwaning one mine is here, Nshwaning two, three, and Black Rock. So before I talk about that, if you look at 
here, it's a photograph standing on the hill, on, on the black rock, looking towards the west. So there in the distance is entwining one and two. Here's the entwining three headgear, and here's the beacon. So this line here is exactly this line that you see at the top here. So this red is the hot as hell formation with the ore bodies, and you can see it's actually structurally deformed. There are normal faults here, yeah, thrown with these downthrown grabens. And then there's structural complexity in the west here yeah, at the hill where there are these thrust faults, where due to compression, um, there's been duplication of the stratigraphy. So the hot as hell formation from out here in the west has been thrust up onto surface. And that's what the outcrop is. If we didn't have this form of tectonics, and we didn't have the structural deformation, all of this would still be lying under the cover of the Kalahari sand. So geologically, it's kind of fortuitous that this little sliver has been now forced up onto the surface. And I'll show you where that fits in, in the entire, in the actual story of the deposit. So, so there's the Onkel de Clavis below, um, the Hottes Hell Formation. That's the vertical shaft of the M22 mine. And this is a decline that they then opened up that goes down and it meets the bottom of the entwining three shaft. And this is where, so the vessel's mine, there's the vessel's mine. So in this particular picture, it's off to the north, but it's mining the exact same ore body, different company. So this is the geological evolution. And um, I, it, I know there's a lot on here, but it's a time sequence from the deposition of the sediments here during the Paleoproterozoic, you we can come through A, B, C, and we come all the way down to more or less the present down here. So that's the original deposition of the chemical sediments, iron and manganese. There have been subsequent intrusions, there's been faulting, there's been erosions, there's been unconformities. Um, and so the question is, when did this suite of secondary minerals form and why? So that's the start of it. This is the main event for minerals, the secondary minerals. In other words, these attractive crystals that we're going to talk about. Um, about 1040 to 1010 million years ago, there was a, an alteration event, which has been called the vessels event, where there was hydrothermal alteration along pathways fault zones that fluids came in and they leached out in there, out the primary ore and they reprecipitated as the high grade ore. Okay. And it's been dated. There's a paper here where um, one of the minerals, which is basically sugilite, sugilite, they dated that as well as um, some of the micas and they came out with that particular age for this particular mineral. Now, not all the minerals are the same age, but the main event for the mineral, the secondary minerals and the high grade ore upgrade was at this particular period. Just going back a step in time slightly, this is the this is the Kais event, and here you see the thrust faults, and it's this that formed that upthrown block along the thrust of uh, the Black Mount of the Black Rock Hill. There's another younger event. It's called the Gloria event, and these are dated. Uh, that's how they know when they happened. And then there's one called the Smart event, 40 to 90 million years ago, with different results. And then a super gene more recently. And in fact, um, some fairly new dates have been done on some of the secondary minerals that were thought to have formed during this older event, but they actually have fought, they're much younger. So there's been different phases of alteration. So let's look at this, because this is the one that relates to the minerals and the mineralogy. So these are two underground shots at the entwining mine, and you can see there's a hammer for scale. There's the ore body, the manganese, and the, and the bandonite formation. And that's a vein of pyrite, a solid vein of pyrite, iron disulfide, which is actually cutting through. This here is, uh, <clears throat> these are veins of calcite, secondary calcite. So obviously there was some opening up of joints. It's not a fault, and these fluids were actually coming through a lot later. And this is part of this vessels event. And just some of the samples also to show you some of the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the cataclastic formations where there was, this is the brecciation of, of the ore body, the iron formation during this 
during these alteration events, which is, which is now filled in the void space with this pink mineral, which is the secondary rhodochrosite. And here, these are blocks, that's about 10 centimeters of, uh, of the ore body, completely broken up and retiated and re-cemented by this secondary pyrite, or now altered to ionide oxide, to guthum. So, minerals related to each of the alteration event. So I've already said that the primary Mamatuan low-grade ore, if you look at a histogram here of percentage, how much of the different events generated how much of the later ore? Well, that primary ore accounts for most of the calorie manganese for, you can see it here, up, almost up to 85%. The high-grade ore of the vessels is only 3%, and that's really what everyone wants because it's a higher grade ore, but it's a very small volume of the resource and the reserve, and the others are virtually insignificant. So you'd think that, well, maybe you wouldn't think, that the bulk of the diversity of the minerals would be sitting in the bulk of the ore body. But if you look at the vessels event, which is small, and you look at the number of minerals that have been documented by Gutzma and others, there are 140 mineral species associated with this alteration event, whereas the sedimentary primary or mineralogically is rather boring. Maybe 10 minerals of the oxide or it's the manganese oxides, and then the others you can see. So it's a, a oxymoron, it's a catch-22, very small amount of high-grade ore, but a huge array of minerals that came out of it and some that came from the younger events. So let's look at some of the famous minerals. Well, <clears throat> I know you can't read that because I can't read it on my screen, but I took this off the mindat.org website. If you go to mindat.org and you search for calorie manganese field uh, yesterday, there are 182 species that are listed. This is an A to Z of all of the minerals there. Okay, 182 minerals that are valid, of which there are 28 type locality species. So 28 new minerals to mineralogy to science were discovered in the calorie manganese field. And obviously, we're not going to look at all of these. There's not enough time. But the famous minerals, the most famous mineral for the calorie manganese field, and it's literally, and I'm not exaggerating, world famous amongst collectors and museum curators is rhodochrosite or rhodochrosite, depending on how you want to pronounce it. It's this manganese carbonate, and it's featured on covers of magazines, of books, on posters for international shows. This is the Tucson International. It's the biggest German mineral show in the world. Um, so they are literally world famous. Um, and well, you know, it's like any collector. These things are collectible. Whether you're collecting mineral specimens or you're collecting uh, Persian carpets or stamps or uh, whatever you collect, you know, Barbie you want dolls. Barbie dolls. You, <laughs> Professor Ashwell has just come out and admitted he collects Barbie dolls. Um, you, you go for things which are attractive. And certainly, I mean, something bright red like this is, uh, is actually quite desirable. So I'm just going to show you some slides of the different varieties and habits of these. They're basically trigonal in there, but they form what are called scalenohedral or dog's tooth crystals. You can see that it looks like a dog's tooth. And they are absolutely blood red. It's, it's a manganese carbonate, and the manganese is, caught, is actually causing the color. Now, these came out for the first time from the Enchoning mine in the mid early 1970s. And at the time, there was a mineral dealer over in South Africa who was actually sniffing around for minerals to take back to America to sell. And he managed to get some of these and he took them back uh, to, the, to that Tucson show. And he offered them for sale there for the first time ever. And when the people saw them, they thought they were fakes. They thought that he'd taken calcite crystals because it's the same morphology and that they'd been dyed somehow with cranberry juice. And uh, and, and but obviously not. And as soon as it was found out what they were, they were like the best examples of the mineral species in the world known. And it created a frenzy. Everyone wanted them, the museums wanted them, and that put the calorie on the map. So these are some here. 
Um, this is one of the very early ones. It's not that impressive, but it comes from that hot as hell mine in the early 1960s with some gypsum. There's some gypsum there. In all of these slides, you'll see I've got the size of the specimen just to give you an idea. There's another one from the hot as hell mine early on. Um, of course, the miners who are mining there, when they go to the face after the blast, they see these and they collect them and they take them out. And so they enter the supply chain of the mineral world. Um, so there's one again, very cherry red. Here's another plate, eight centimeters. The white that you see on here is um, sometimes it's actually calcite, a thin coating. Sometimes it's quartz. Um, and what some people have tried to do, they, um, they try to etch the quartz off because it's all white and they want to see the red. But it's difficult to acid etch a silicate off a carbonate. You destroy the carbonate underneath. So sometimes they would sit for hours, if not days, with a little pin to pick it off. And that's probably what's happened here. There's this residual after they've picked away a lot of the, of the cover. But some came out clean. Here's another example, 16 centimeters. It looks like um, red, this particular habit, almost like broccoli uh, or little or small sort of cauliflower. This is the red. This is the pink variety. Sort of a similar, that's a 20 centimeter piece. That's quite big. But it's actually just a coating because if you look at the top here, it's a little bit fractured. You can see underneath this, it's got the red. So it's like two generations of growth. Some of it is gem quality and, we, and can be faceted, as you can see here. Um, usually they only take the damaged crystals because a mineral specimen, which is perfect, is worth a lot of money and can be faceted. Um, <clears throat> Some of the prices are very high for the South African rhodochrosite. They can be thousands of US dollars per carat. So if you're thinking of getting engaged, uh, think twice, because it's a very soft mineral. It's a carbonate. You can't put it in your wedding ring. Um, <clears throat> they've been featured at these shows, as I said before. There's, the second biggest show in the world is the Munich show in Germany, the München Mineralientage. And in 2012, they had a theme for all of the exhibits, and it was Africa. So this was a specimen that was on display um, at that show in Munich. But what really um, stopped the crowds there was this little display case. Um, and it was kind of like, uh, you know, standing in line to see the Mona Lisa by Da Vinci, um, because these two specimens drew crowds from all over. Um, the one on the, here on the left belongs to, to Assel. It's in their corporate head office, and it's about that big, like this. And it's there in the office. Um, it's, as far as I know, and I haven't seen everything, but it's maybe the largest preserved specimen. But on the right here is a very, very, fa very famous specimen called the snail. So I took a close-up of it. it. Looks like this. And you can see why they called it the snail. This is the gem ruby red rhodochrosite, and it's on the black mineral is manganite, the, the manganese oxide. And if you look carefully, it's got a very flat base. It's all because when the particular specimen was discovered in the mid 1970s, it was on a large piece of matrix with that sitting on the edge, almost like a pimple. So what the collector did, who finally got it, they sawed the base off to make it stand nicely. Um, and uh, it's, it's um, as far as I know, it's in, in the Bill Larson collection in California. When I last did it, it was still there. Um, and it is, if you want to start collecting minerals, a multi-million dollar specimen. So um, there's money to be made in minerals if you know what to do and where to get them. And I haven't made much money, but um, this is a, from the same area of that particular pocket. It's a similar type, but without the matrix, sort of like a rosette, four centimeters, all from a Chining mine. And all of these came out in the early 1970s when they were sinking that shaft. They've never been found again like this. It was a one-off thing. That's why they're so there. Here's one at the Ditsong Museum here in North in Pretoria. If you go to the Geology Museum there, I don't know, maybe you've been. They've got two specimens on display. This is one here. See Rhodoctosite. It says hot as hell, but it might be from a chuaning. I'm not sure. 
Um, but they've got, and it's a pretty impressive piece. It's about the size of a brick. Um, but there's another one in that same museum, mine in Pretoria. Um, and in this book by Peter Bancroft, German Crystal Treasures, he wrote this book, um, I think it was in the 1980s, featuring the top mineral localities in the world and the world's best specimens. And he came to South Africa and he went to the manganese mines and um, he relates how he had a discussion with the mine director at the enshrining mine. And he quotes him here, this is what the mine director said, where we hit these fantastic jewel-like pockets a few hundred feet from the surface. The rhodochrosite occurred in small vugs or cavities in the hausmanite, which is the, again the manganese ore, and was associated with calcite and other minerals. The pockets were small, but the largest were spectacular, half a meter by a meter, and took three days to carefully dig out. You can imagine being there and taking out these cherry red things. And the largest specimen recovered is over 100 kilograms in the Pretoria Museum, and there it is there. I took that photo a few years ago. I think it's still there. Um, it, I think weight-wise, it's bigger than that asshole one I showed you in Germany, but I, it's, it's not quite as aesthetic. Anyway, that's it there. Here's another one showing you a different type of habit. If you look at these crystals, they've all got flat terminations. So the, the, scalina, uh, the scalina lead, scalinahedral habit has got a, a basal pinacoid on it. And actually, it's two generations of growth. You can kind of see carefully there's an, there's an internal phantom here, and then it's got this clearer overgrowth. And again, forming this sort of rosette, 11 centimeters. Then this type they call wheat sheaf. You know, if you go into the, into the wheat fields, when they put the wheat together and they tie it around, you see these bundles and it looks, it's got this pink core with the transparent red terminations. Again, on the manganite. This is the rhombohedral form, which for some reason, and I need to speak a crystallographer to, to ask why, it's a very rare habit or form in the Kalahari field, the, the rhombohedral form. Remember I told you I'm a coal geologist, so I don't know the reason why they are the rhombus. It's the other form. It's the, the other one, the scalinohedral, by miles. These are very rare. They, they do come out occasionally, but they read. And they're both rhombohedral in the yes. crystal system, so you got to be careful. The form, yeah, exactly. The actual morphology of the, of the crystal. Yeah. If you take the rhomb and you stretch it out, you form the scalinohedral form. Yeah. I do know that as a gold geologist. <laughs> and then there's some very strange types of rhodochrosite. They're these, which look like um, eggs, they are absolutely perfect spheres. And these are three different specimens taken at different times. This is in a collection here in South Africa. This is one that was on display in 1993 at the Tucson show. It looks like two marshmallows sort of that are stuck together. And here's one that was on display at the Munich show in a museum collection. And it's an absolutely perfect sphere, a complete solid inside of the gross light. Then there's this looking like a little chimney it's small it's only it's just under three centimeters um it might be a pseudomorph of type you know racing the minority of vagots five five point two centimeters and these very elongate look the rhodochrosite and it's also color zone it's sort of amber brown to pale pink forming in the vag and this um almost like a, a wig of this really looking over this what look but this is actually a mineral it's, it's called sussexite this this brown mineral it's one of the rare minerals and then this and again this the field of view here is only 1.3 centimeters so this is small because of the limit of my camera lens but it's it's what's called it's a, uh, I think the Germans call it a Faden um and it's you, there's like a, a hazy growth down the middle here, like a, a vague ghost. And from there, the crystals go outwards at right angles to this. And that's, it's a very common habit in quartz. You see Faden quartzes, especially from the Swiss Alps. But this is a little Faden of rhodochrosite. <clears throat> and this vermiform, like worms, again, you know, 
So the habit here is extremely diverse. And that's also what makes it attractive. You know, you can collect all the different, if you can afford it, the different types and forms of a word. So the question always is, when did this form? Was it during that vessels event you know, that we've been speaking about during the, during the Proterozoic? Or was it later? And the smart alteration event, which was about 45 to 90 million years ago, might be when they form. Because one of the minerals that occurs here is a mineral um, called, it's called tadorakite. It's this, it's almost like asbestos. It's a fibrous manganese mineral and it formed quite late. And some of the rhodochrosite is actually intergrown with it. So therefore, if the, if the rhoda is intergrown with the tadorakite, the rhoda has to be younger, obviously. Um, so some of the, of the rhodochrosite appears to have formed at a very late stage during one of these very much more later events. Um, that's not to say it all formed then, but but the actual, those ones I've been showing you came from um, a long time ago, the mid 70s. Okay, remember this is a manganese mine and there's, there's not much else there except iron and manganese. So I just wanna show you some of the other kind of unusual minerals that you wouldn't expect to find there in this type of a deposit. You have some cinnabar, which is mercury sulfide, okay? It's this, these tiny little pink, like sugary grains, yeah? on the black platy hausmanite, okay? So cinnabar, I mean, mercury, very rare. And here's some of the cinnabar inside calcite crystals, like dendritic, almost fern-like inclusions inside the calcite. There's only a, literally a handful of these known, actually. And the fact that they were collected is quite remarkable. Then galena, you all know galena, lead sulfide from the lead zinc deposits. Um, I hear you laughing, so you must know. But in the world of Galena, the Galena specimens from the Calari manganese field are forgettable. They are very rare, and they are just a silvery coating on some of the other minerals. Here's one which is very esoteric. It's called Despugilsite. It's a calcium manganese sulfate hydrate. And um, very esoteric, but the best in the world from a mineralogical standpoint. Largest. Sphalerite, zinc sulfide. Again, there's no, virtually no zinc there. This is, again, isn't as you would know sphalerite. It's, it's a sort of olive green coating, a thin veneer on these calcite fingers with tiny little galenas on them. Again, there's only a handful of these known. And then this attractive orange, um, I don't know if you know the mineral axonite. But this is a manganese bearing axonite called tinzonite. It's a calcium aluminium borate. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's known elsewhere. The manganese mines in Italy also produce this. But about half a dozen are found in a tiny little bug in the mine at the vessels mine, and that was it. And they managed to collect all. So they put there. Copper, native copper, there's virtually none. This is a tiny, tiny piece. Okay, again, so it, it's saying to you things like lead, copper, zinc, mercury, are almost non-existent in the genesis of this whole body. Then the other famous minerals, some that look like ice cream cones. Um, and I'll run through these quickly um, because this is also what museums and curators like to, like to have. There's this yellow mineral, which is called ettringite. It's this prismatic crystal you see here, some with some calcite. And these, this etching guide with calcite and with the manganite. It's named after the town of Ettingen in Germany. That's the type locality where crystals, if you want to see them, you have to look down a microscope. These are the best etching guides in the world by orders of magnitude. And they came out in the early 1980s in their thousands. They hit a zone in the mine and hardly ever since. It's an odd thing about the calorie manganese field. They seem to hit these zones with this peculiar mineralogy, and they are once off. They're not repeated. Some are. I mean, obviously, calcite, for example, you get everywhere. This is another mineral. Um, just, just remember this. It, oops. Um, it's a sulfate, okay, calcium aluminum sulfate. So here's another sulfate, calcium only. This is called tormosite, okay? 
And again, these are one centimeter crystals, which in the scheme of things is not huge, but these are the biggest in the world. They're small, but they're the biggest in the world. And believe it or not, some have been faceted. They're very soft. They have a hardness, I think, of about three and a half. The fancy people facet them. And then sturmonite. Again, look at the composition. You see it's a sulfate again, calcium iron sulfate. And some of these crystals, it's hexagonal. You can see here in cross-section. This is a 14 centimeter crystal. This is one about the size of two thirds of a brick. Um, and um, the Calari manganese field is the type locality. Sturmonite was discovered there. Again, many of them, but hardly ever since, okay. Halsmanite. Halsmanite is one of the main ore minerals there in the massive ore. But sometimes <clears throat> when space is available, it forms these beautiful pagoda-like, highly lustrous, black, shiny crystals. Yeah. Um, yeah, associated with andradite garnet. The andradite garnet, that's an ocean. It's not prime dimension at all. This so one, you see the pink. It's one of the boron species. Hematite is pervasive in the iron ore formations, but sometimes um, some of the, arguably, the best hematites in the world have come from the Calari manganese field, the crystals, the aesthetic crystals. Okay. And this is one that the late Roger Dixon and I featured on the cover of our, our first book. It's associated again with um, the orange is andradite garnet, and that's barite. Okay. So it's so a barite, hematite, garnet. Uh, Stop sharing. Oh, no, it's chat. Oh, oh, I can see. Yeah. yeah sorry. Yeah. Here's another hematite. Rather strange habit. These hexagonal columnar like crystals, okay, uh, from the vessels mine, 12 centimeters. And these little white globules you see here are strontium sulfate, okay, strontianite. Bizarre mineral assemblages. Um, can I ask a quick? Yeah. But you know, all these amazing crystal forms, are these all broken in clouds? Or, or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You have to have the space for any of these things to grow to get an external form, which is, you know, well formed like this. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the space available in a vug, a cavity, or an opening in a fault, you don't get them. Yeah. I'm going to show you some slides underground. You see some of them. Of this. Big spot is one of the other main manganese ores, also down south in the Porsmusberg. It's a cubic mineral. So, you know, amongst the collectors, black and white minerals are not very desirable because you want flashy things. But uh, cubic big spot is of, of this size is quite rare. And then this that looks a bit like an orc. It's um, manganese, calcium manganese carbonate called Kutna Horite. If you look at the ternary, ternary diagram, for rhodochrosite, calcite, the horite, the calcium and the manganese carbonate. There's, depending on the amount of manganese in them, you can have calcium rhodochrosite, manganocalcite. So strictly speaking, you know, this is cut in the horite with the manganese, but if it's got less manganese in the crystal stone, maybe manganocalcite, for example. In general, the people who collect if you see the sort of coliform ice cream type of habit, they tend to call it cut no right. So, yeah. Um, my whole talk is about oh, okay. Do you mean the what, what do you mean the Kalahari? You mean anywhere in the Kalahari Desert? When you say the Kalahari, this is the, if I understand you, you're correct. The Kalahari manganese field is this area geographic with the manganese mines. And all of these come from that Kalahari manganese field, the mines I've been talking about. So if you go north into Botswana, into the Kalahari, 
you find sand. So it's only in these mines. It's okay. There's another red mineral, but it's a silicate, not a carbonate. It's the calcium manganese form of a silicate, and it's, it's called inosite. Um, and the white in, here in the front is a common mineral called natrolite, which you may know about. But these platy crystals of inosite also are considered to be some of the best known from anywhere in the world. And if you, <clears throat> I'm speaking to the students here now, if you do your metamorphics, up, you probably know about prenite or as a secondary mineral. It's usually a green mineral, but in the Kalahari, it's this orangey red. Because in the crystal structure of the prenite, in the silicate structure, it gets a small amount of manganese, which imparts this orangey color to it, which is quite unusual. The strontium sulfate, the celestine, these sprays, fan like, that's a big specimen, 17 centimeters, pale blue. And then <clears throat> this mineral is a talk on its own. It's called chisel light. Um, and I'll get back to it when we talk about the type minerals, but just to say that it's found in the calorium manganese, it's quite an attractive pink mineral. Again, a calcium sodium manganese form of the silicate, chisolite. But you see, I've got a paper down here. By, it's by Dreisettel and it, in 2019. It says, discreditation of the pyroxenide mineral named Marshall Sussmanite with the reinstatement of the name chisolite. So if you know anything about mineralogy, to discredit something is not great, but I'll tell you why in a short while. We did it with that. Exactly. Yeah. The sugilite or sugilite, as some people talk about, is this purple mineral. And um, <clears throat> it is known from other parts, the type locality is in Japan, but the sugilite or the sugilite from the Kalahari manganese field is world famous. It's used extensively in the gem and the jewelry trade for the manufacture of objet de art, um, brooches, rings, cabochons, etc. It's very difficult to get the true color with a digital camera and even with film, because it's actually purple. And some of this comes out a bit blue, but short of really manipulating my images in Photoshop. Um, it's a massive mineral, but sometimes it forms these rare crystals. And these are crystals of the sugilite, uh, yeah, which are about a centimeter. Um, you know, it may not mean much to a lot of people, but to collectors, th th that is unique in the world of, of mineralogy. All right, so what's happened uh, in the last 20 odd years or so? Well, in uh, the mid 2000s, I think from about 2004 to 2008, for about four years, um, a contractor got a legal contract to mine for mineral specimens in the enshrining mine. It was a legally agreed to contract between him and the mine management. And he had a team. I think there were about eight of them. He had a, uh, he, had a he was actually an engineering geologist. And um, he had miners, a team of four miners, a uh, um, shift boss who could blast. And they went into the mine in areas where they weren't actively mining to mine for mineral specimens to sell on the open market. And um, there he is. That's Paul Bellier. He's a, he's a Frenchman. And this is him underground. Now, you asked about the vugs. So here you can see we underground. He has the face. And you can see these little cavities here. And there's some of the rhodochrosite inside the cavity. And some are, and some are solid. So sometimes completely. And you just have this massive. Now, you must know that this is manganese ore. And you hit with a hammer. And it bounces back and hits you on the head. And it's like steel. So trying to collect these minerals intact and undamaged is very, very difficult. And the amount that come out, which are perfect and undamaged, is very small. But he managed to do so. And he had two major fines while he was doing it. Um, where he was working, that zone is um, probably two and a half meters. But in the mine next door, at the vessel's mine, you know, that's that MN1, that main ore body. They, uh, some of their mining height is up to about four meters. So you can drive around them. 
It's it's not like uh, we never had it. But the mineral, one of the mineral that came out there is a new type mineral. It's this mineral called Olmeite. And this is a paper which is published in the MINREC in 2008. Olmeite and Paul de Fartite. Now that's another name of a mineral. And so I'll tell you about it in a short while. But um, they just say down here, the two species cannot be distinguished. The chemistry is very similar. Now, Balier was mining the zone where the Olmeites, these new minerals came out. And here's a shot I took underground of a VUG again. And that cavity is probably um, about 20 centimeters. And you can see the crystals. This orangey here is that Olmeite mineral. And, but the others, this sort of white, looks like little fur or cotton wool. That's the mineral built for tainite, which is a silicate. And then there are these, it may be hard to see, but there's tiny little acicular gray crystals. That's the, um, that's the celestine again. So that's what it looks like in situ. Now you want to get those out intact. And of course, you know, he, he'll drill, you drill around or, and they just fall out and they get damaged. This is some Olmeites, and I just want to show them to you what they look like. So that's the composition. It's a calcium, manganese, silicate, hydroxide. This is a bow tie. It looks like a bow tie type, the cream colored. This is all the same mineral. This is an orangey sphere, a ball up on matrix, uh, four centimeters. Yeah, four of them. That one's a bit bigger than a cricket ball, okay? And some are very gemmy and associated with the uh, a few other minerals here. Yeah? Same mineral, it's now chocolate brown. Um, and, you know, and it's got this intergrowth again, forming semi spherical aggregates of these crystals on calcite. He has the same mineral you know, with some calcite. That's why calcium is chromiite. And the black, which is analyzed by some researchers in Italy, is carbon carbon or kerogen. Um, some people say it's the exhaust fume from the diesel machinery underground. Uh, probably not. This is an ormeite crystal on some matrix. Again, that's four centimeters. That's big. Remember, this is all a new mineral science in the last 20 years. There's another one. That's the ormeite sitting inside calcite. Again, the scalenohedral calcite. Olmeite with the celestine. This is all the strontium sulfate, 14 centimeters. And then this piece, um, these are all tiny sort of caramel colored olmeite with this white needle. If you touch it, it's like um, fiberglass. It goes into your fingers. That's the Bultfonteinite. If you know the diamond area in Kimberley, there's a Bultfontein diamond mine. Maybe you've heard of it. That's the type of locality for Bultfonteinite but you get it in the manganese field as well. And the interesting thing about Olmeite, it fluoresces red in long wave ultraviolet light. So that's the normal, that's under ultraviolet light. Okay, if you get bored seeing all of these minerals and all these Olmeites, well, you could, there's always something you can do. You can, that's Paul Bellier trying to sell his Olmeites at the Muni show. And the man at the back is not very impressed. <laughs> okay, the other, the other mineral I just want to talk about that he mined is this mineral called shigaite. Now, I know these things are all esoteric, but the Kalahari minerals on the cover of this magazine in America, shigaite. It's a micaceous mineral. It looks, if you recognize it, it looks like your biotite or your muscovite. But it's, if you look at the composition, it's very different. And there's a sulfate again, aluminium, manganese, sodium, hydrate. And it's featured in some publications. There's a, in the German magazine, the Lapis, new find of shigaites from the Kalahari manganese field. Um, it was discovered firstly at Enshrining Mine in the early 90s, but up until then, it was a very rare mineral. And the crystallographers who work on these things, they'd never really been able to determine the crystal structure of the shigaite. So once they found some of these in the Kalahari, some reached Mark Cooper and Frank Hawthorne in Canada, and they resolved the crystal structure of the Shigai based on the Kalahari manganese specimen. So, you know, they're valuable to science. So this is, again, a view underground 
um, at the mine in the Shigaite zone. And I can't zoom in, but you can see the height of the working face here. He's, Paul has just blasted, and so he has the rubble. And you can kind of see these cavities, bugs in the wall here, where some of these crystals were coming out of. And there's one in situ. That's about almost four centimeters across. So there's the cavity, the dissolution cavity, that then started to be lined like a geode with pink rhodochrosite. And obviously the, the, the chemical composition of the fluid changed after the carbon and then formed the shigaite inside the vote. Here's another example, it's small, but the shigaite with the rhodochrosite uh, on the matrix. There's another one. It's almost got a metallic type of luster to it. And sometimes the, you get a stacking of the crystals forming this sort of an aggregate. These are the biggest shigaite crystals in the world by an order of magnitude. And this one, we'd been underground in the mine for three days helping, I was helping him there. And we opened up a small vote. And this came out of the one cavity that Paul's holding in his hand there. And once it was cleaned up, it's, um, that's the crystal sitting vertically on edge with bare right, lots of small shigaites, and this is all rhodochrosite down about here. And that's a 3.2 centimeter crystal. That's like finding a, a, a kilometer long quartz crystal. I mean, that is enormous. It's by far the biggest thing, and only one. The rest, there was nothing in the cavity straight. And then this funny mineral called Gatehouse site, it's a phosphate, one of the few phosphates apart from apatite that's found with the Shigo. All right, the last part of my talk, I just want to maybe talk a little bit about the type locality species. Now, as of today, I checked, uh, there are 28 species discovered in the Kalahari manganese field. Now, type mineralogy, is a subdiscipline of mineralogy. And uh, it, amongst the people who look for new minerals, it's extremely competitive. There's, a, there's certain groups around the world who hunt for new minerals. It's like the meteorite hunters, you know. And, uh, and some of them are quite competitive to see who can describe the most new minerals known to science. And you have just um, some publications that are out there. Um, Daltrey, who was he's deceased, but he was in South Africa and worked for a while at the then University of Natal and then the survey, he published quite a few papers on the type mineralogy of Africa, uh, type mineral species uh, of South Africa. It's one of the CGS handbooks, Namibia. And he has a fairly recent book, The Type Minerals of Africa, published in Belgium. The problem with these books or articles is they are doomed to be out of date virtually as they come out because they are continually being new species discovered every year. 30 to 40 sometimes per annum. Some of them are microscopic. But um, so it's interesting to see what has the calorie manganese field produced. Well, here's the list. Here's an A, to, an A to Z list of all of them. And I've put some asterisks along some of them. Uh, there are 28, 14 remain unique. They've never been discovered anywhere since. They're still only known from here, okay, which is quite interesting. And two of them, Nchwaningite, is named after the Nchwaning mine because it was discovered there. And Vessel site is named after the Vessels mine. When you discover a new mineral, or if you are one of the researchers who work on them, you name them. You can only name a mineral three ways. It has to be after the locality where it was found, after a person, alive or deceased, or after its chemical composition. Okay, so if you look at these names, they will be named after people or after localities, like the two mines here. So the Vessels mine, okay, is currently this month uh, globally that in the top 20, the 20th most prolific type locality in the world for new minerals. And 18 type locality minerals have come from the Vessels mine. That's about something. That's also why the mineralogy there is so famous and research is actually ongoing. Does it, anyone have any idea where one of the top localities in the world are for type minerals? It's in Namibia. Sumeb mine. 
Our neighbor in Namibia, Sumib Mine, is one of the top localities. But still, Vessels Mine is not there. So let's, I'm going to just quickly show you what some of these actually, what they look like. This is, and I'm, and I'm doing it by date, from the first one, which was discovered in 1980, up until last year. Braunite 2. Now, Braunite is one of the ore minerals. Okay, if you look at its composition, calcium, manganese, silicate. Um, but Braunite doesn't have the calcium in. So it's one of the um, type locality species. And you see it here, it's this black mineral, again, with the andradite garden. So that's the first one. Here's the sturmanite again. And just to maybe give you some insight, um, not one of these 28 minerals was described 100% by researchers in South Africa. Some of them have got co-authors on in South Africa, but the work is done overseas because not many people do this kind of work here. So sturmanite is named after Wazidar Sturman, who was the curator of mineralogy in Canada. The people working on this decided, let's name it after him. Even though he might not have anything to do with the Kalahari, it doesn't matter. They named it in his honor. This brownish material here, which looks like nothing, is called olimonite, and it's with the inner site and calcite. And it's again a calcium manganese silicate, and it's named after this man, Orlando Lyman, who uh, was curator of a museum in Hawaii. So there's a mineral named after Hawaii, a man working in Hawaii. I want to pause here for von Betzingite because it's this blue mineral and that is Ludi von Betzing. He's a doctor who lives in Kimberley. Um, so he's a medical doctor, but he's a mineral collector. And several of the type locality species he has discovered and passed them on to workers in Vienna who have described them. And he got this blue mineral from a miner who told him it was azurite. But he recognized it had a different crystal morphology and he sent it and it turned out to be a calcium copper form of a sulfate and they named it von Betzingite in his honor. Still only known from the vessels mine. This is the poldefartite I showed you earlier on. It looks like this. It looks a bit like the Olmiite, but it's a little bit different. Named after Adi Poldefart, who um, it was attached to the, U the University of Cape Town in the 1940s, and he did a lot of work on dolerites in South Africa. So they named this mineral in his honor. Heno Martinite. Um, Heno Martin is a, you talk to any geologist from Namibia, Southwest Africa, Heno Martin and Hermann called the two geologists who wrote a book called The Sheltering Desert, um, how during the Second World War, they were geologists in the then Southwest Africa, and in order to avoid being called up to the army to go and fight in the war, they went and hid in the Namib Desert for two years. And they lived there for two years in a cave in the Kuseb River in the Namib Desert. And they wrote this book, Shouting Desert. That's Heno Martin. And this mineral, which are these orangey red fibrous crystals on the switcherite, is named in his honor, Heno Martinite. If in Bergerite, a blue mineral, if you see any blue mineral in the Kalahari, you should immediately be suspicious because it should be something weird. Named after Professor Effenberger, University of Vienna. It's this blue mineral associated with the sugilite. Barium copper silicate. Here's the entwiningite. It's this funny little brown, looks almost like sea urchins. But that's small, that's only 1.2 centimeters. It's a manganese two plus form of the silicate. Named, found it in Chining Mine, so they named it after the mine. Another blue mineral, vessel site named after the vessel's mine, the strontium copper form of silicate. Vesuvianite, you might know, well, if you have enough manganese in it, it's mangan Vesuvianite with a formula that takes up the whole line on a page. And it's this really attractive wine red form of Vesuvianite. It has enough manganese in it to qualify as a new species. And here you see some with the ettringite, 2002. Twedalite, uh, micro, this is a tiny crystal, it's taken a shot down a microscope. Um, <clears throat> and it's also gone a bit of, undergone a bit of a name change and it's named after Samuel Tweddle, who passed away a long time ago, but he was the first curator of the museum 
in Pretoria. So in 2002, um, they named the mineral in his honor. Holstermite is a peculiar tetragonal hydro garnet named after Dan Holstam um, on the Swedish Research Council. You notice a lot of these African minerals, South African minerals are named after people outside of South Africa. So but, we have a chain I don't know, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, Here's the Olmiak, um, and it, named after Professor Olmi in Italy. The Italians also have a very famous manganese deposit, and they do a lot of research on manganese also. They identified this, and they named it in his honor. Widotiite, which looks like something you would just walk over. It's this black, brownish manganese mineral. Von Betzingite picked this up, and he thought that looks interesting. Send it off. New mineral, named in honor, in honor of Professor Guidotti at the University of Maine. Levinskyite, new mineral, lo and behold. Lithium, potassium, copper form of a silicate. And there is Rob Levinsky, named after him because he had the piece which he acquired from a mineral dealer living in Kakamas in the Northern Cape. So from Kakamas to Tucson, Arizona. And uh, he gave the specimen for analysis, so they named it in his honor, Levinsky. And another blue mineral, barium copper silicate again, Scottyite, after Michael Scott. The first CEO of Apple Computers, a mineral named after him. Why? Why would you name this mineral after the CEO of Apple Computers? Google, Google his name and you'll find out why. Played a very important role in mineralogy in the University of Tucson, Arizona. And another blue mineral, we'll just keep on coming. Dio Gattaite, after Diego Gatta, another Italian. Okay, massive. It's it's this. Uh, do you see the scale here? That's a millimeter. It's this funny turquoisey. You know the guys get this stuff and they look at it and they probe it and they finally discover it's a new mineral. And this is the shizzleite. And it's. I can tell you afterwards, but they discovered this mineral um, <laughs> at the Vessels Mine and the Twining Mine, and they thought it was a mineral called. Rhodonite, which is a manganese form of silicate. Some of it went overseas to a show in Denver, the Denver show, and it was sold there as bustamite, which is another massive pink mineral that comes from the Kalari manganese field. And the Smithsonian bought a piece and they took it back and they analyzed it and it wasn't bustamite. It looked like with XRD, it could be pectolite, part of the pectolite sarandite series. This is like Sherlock Holmes detective. But in the meantime, some work was done down at the University of Arizona in Tucson on this, and it was seen to be a new mineral. And because this dealer here, Marshall Sussman, a uh, collector dealer, had provided the samples, they named it in his honor, Marshall Sussman, okay? and it was approved by the IMA. Um, unfortunately, um, it turned out that is identical to this mineral called shizzleite that was already described from Greenland in the early 1900s. It was identical and it was unfortunately not identified by the Arizona workers. So the older name has to take precedence, like they say it's grandfather, but it goes back and they do away with the Marshall system. So after that long story, shizzleite, and it's the best shizzleite in the world. Once, once you declare the mineral, no, you can never use that. Never, again. never. So they can never name a mineral again in his honor. <laughs> it's just a rule. Yeah. Well, who asked? So yes, my, um, this is Ludi von Betzing, the Kimberley doctor. Again, he was digging around. He had permission. He was digging around on the old dumps up there, and he uh, he, he found this mineral which looks a bit like talc almost. And he thought, again, he thought it looks a bit different. So he sent it off and it was analyzed again by the workers um, in Austria and they discovered it's a new mineral and they asked me, can they name it after me? I said, yeah, sure. Um, and, uh, so 
<laughs> I, I would, um, had I thought at the time, he actually called me up, von Betzing, and he told me this. And he actually told me, they'd already decided that, and he was telling me, do I object? So I said, well, I'm not going to object. But, but I think Birker's site of the Nick Birkus would be very appropriate. <laughs> Colin Owen, Colin Owen site, another blue mineral. Boy. Okay. He was an interesting guy. He was a mineral dealer that lived down in Somerset West in the Cape, and he was a world authority on beetles, a few beetles named after him. Insect beetles, not the, not the. And he also is an expert on war medals, but he is also on minerals. Yeah. Maidenite, this man here. And this rock here is where the Maidenite is. And I don't know if you can see, but there's sort of orangey blurs here. That's it. That's the new mineral. Okay. This, look, this slab has produced four, I think, four type species out of this one sample you know, probing and looking. Lipperwhite, orangey mineral here, named after Professor Hu Li. Uh, <clears throat> again, uh, Mr. China, because some of the analytical work has been done by the Chinese researchers. Um, here's one which is quite appropriate, Tanya Yakawite. That's Tanya and Yako von Livanese. And they live just north of Karkamas. And they provided that sample to the researchers in the University of Arizona, where a lot of them are. So they named this brownish mineral here after them in their honor. And that's quite nice. Supreme is another one of these, one of these Vesuvian type of minerals. Um, it's not very spectacular, it's a tiny mineral. 2015, uh, let me just close this. Uh, I was looking. I've got a specimen in my collection and it's a little nondescript thing about three, four centimeters with a bit of the suja light on. And I was looking at it down my binocular microscope and I saw these funny brown crystals. And for once I thought they looked kind of odd. So I took a small piece and I sent them over to a contact friend of mine who does this work, identifying new species, Yang, University of Arizona. And he analyzed them. And lo and behold, it's actually Strontia ruizite. Now, ruizite was a known species, but there's enough strontium in these microcrystals that's only 3.2 millimeters to be a new species. So they describe, in the same time they did the Tanya Yakawite, they describe the Strontia ruizite. And yeah, also very appropriate. Here's the Sakawite, named after the father and son Guido and Desmond Sakawa in their honor because of the role they played in the discovery and the mining of the manganese fields. It's these funny green, very hairy, acicular mineral that you see here with uh, the sturmonite and the etringite, um, named after the father's son. Yuzu Zhangat, um, do you recognize the sample? There's the, another type species from this, and there's a little label um, that Yako and actually wrote blue spots and green mineral from the vessel's mine. Only this piece from an old collection. Okay. Yuzu Yangat. And this is one of the most recent ones, which is Maglassonite. This is Jim Maglasson, who's a very well known mineral expert in um, America. And uh, it's, it's hydroxyl. You see, it's got the OH one. So it's called hydroxyl Maglasson. It's, it's not. It's not this blue, it's that, I'm pointing, it's that little smaller than my pointer, it's that speck sitting there. That's the hydroxyl maglassin light. So, I'm nearly finished. I've got about three slides left or so. Just to, the sugi light, Gunsma talks about the sugi light assemblage of minerals. There's this whole suite of minerals, amphiboles, pyroxenes, garnets, hydroxyls, with two sugilite samples down here. And a lot of these first discovered type species come from the sugilite assemblage. Um, and it's always worthwhile having a look at those closely to see if there's not something strange in them, especially if it's blue. Uh, 
So these are the type minerals in the sugulite assemblage. And look at the list. I mean, it's substantive. Look at the elements, barium, strontium, common element in a lot of these, some lithium, very rare, okay? But all of these are coming out of this assemblage. So the, the actual genesis of them is, you know, unique. So um, you've heard the talk, so if you want to, you can read the books. Um, again, these are the two books that were sponsored by ASSEL uh, with, my, with Nick Birkus, Jens Gutzma, the late Nick Birkus. This one's unfortunately out of print, but this one is still available um, through the company, through ASSEL. So the future, um, well, there is still mining going on for sure, and the iron and uh, the manganese deposits are still producing. Um, research is continuing. In fact, only within the last year, there's an MSc that was done at um, Rhodes University on the paragenesis of that Ormeite assemblage. It's just come out through Rhodes University. So things are still active and very much alive. Uh, so thank you for your attention. I spoke for a long time, but I'm happy to take questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce, for this amazing talk and amazing. Okay. Glad to, if there are any questions, please care. Um, you can go ahead and ask them now. Um, well, the point also to be part. The first article about the decision to and the second article about the So I was involved in the second part and the third part. So the minerals that you see, the photo, are from various different um, green to get access to some of the top collection, not just the other, but the people who are going to be So some of those are some of them are in my collection, but um, others are from other collections. Um, and you can use them. I put it off, for example, some of the specimens in the Overjoy Museum, some in the Sophie. That's the question. Yeah, that's the question. Yeah, that's the question. you know, there's some, there's some things you can buy, but some, maybe not the magnesium, but there are a lot of things, there's not so much that you can in America, for example, stay here. You can go and get yourself. What do you think? Yeah, you can go to the original, old original diamond market in the Colorado River. You can pick up just the agates. So you don't have to. The question is, has anyone discovered valuable minerals in their background? Not the general answer is this one. If you don't know the story, you know, 
Oh, okay. Um, we're going to move from the way to fill this off. Um, on the data, which is sitting in the blue belt data file. So you can use a blue day. A few days ago, one of the local and the local people who lived there said, we need to back it off. And they found the amethyst chips near the purple pool. Deep amethyst. And that started a rock. Then you started to dig. Virtually in the village in the backyard, and they found these very amethysts in the bush of Amethyst that they still are digging up today in the room. And they're bringing them through to Korea and to the key markets in the room. So, but finally, yeah, in my backyard. Yeah. But, so, the information is fine. Small. Small. But the no exception to the environment and gold, and that's not enough to go to the world. And you can be too much. Anytime the artifacts. Well, not the whole story, but the national heritage, not enough to die, protects the national heritage of Solomon, and heritage in the broadest sense, um, paintings, um, shipwrecks. And in that act, it actually says protected of meteorites, any archaeological material, whether it's land access or shipwreck tankers or whatever. And interestingly enough, in that act, it says a very geological study. <laughs> so, by the letter of the law, you know, they own a rare geological space, but the problem is there's no definition in the act of what constitutes an X. <laughs> and to my mind, it's clearly the east side of it. So, but, yeah. Probably. Oh, you, you see it. Yeah. Now, you're supposed to leave it, and you should come and by law to go to court. I don't think it's sent back to your cookie and joke of things that are finding the money back. Can I just find that earlier? Can we show you the rough titles of movies or anything else? Any other questions that you want to ask? And I'm going to go to the show. Girls, this. Yeah. Um, you said this one. No, 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 much later than some of the much older members. But the, one of my colleagues at UJ, John Browns, dated, I didn't speak about it, but there's another member called the Buffalo. And uh, I gave him one of the crystals to date for that. And it came out at the same, uh, about 30 million years, pretty much. So this is. They all have different degrees, depending on the you know, the geological phenomena that they're in the sun. They form in the middle. It's always been assumed that that's what we think. Very important. That was the general thought 50 years ago. But, you know, the people went to the middle of the middle. Thank you for being smart. Thanks. Not smart, but I thought it and the green assistant of Louis Boyle will get their new table. That's it. So it's the third. I don't know, and I don't think anyone can say that. You know, that, you know the kites event with those first, which is, which just predates the vessel event. Um, Witzler says that the, that the 
dust plains, and some of those normal plots of the gardens were the pathways that the fluids were coming from, you know, that they came along. Because he, he can very nicely, he actually documented from the, from the center of one of those pathways, if you look at the mineralogy going outwards, a bit like the magnetic stripes you see on the ocean floor, you can see mineral zoning moving away as these fluids were moving out. Um, uh, but I'll just tell you that uh, there is a general consensus that, I mean, the, the UJ, we call it school of thought, Lotus and Gritzmark, have a, you know, hydrothermal, but others see it all as a big super gene event, you know, so it's a bit like the Brits in a sense, you know, they try to um, <coughs> magnetic fluids or, or not, because there is evidence for super gene and hydrothermal. But certainly those structural surfaces acted as pathways for the fluids, for the high grade. So the specification of the mineral is maybe more or not in action with the specification of the vegetation. Well, it's not, I mean, I haven't memorized his PhD. That's sort of like a benchmark. What was done before, actually, as well, um, if I think about it, um, uh, Frank Stuber, who worked for Mintec, did his PhD on, but he worked mainly on the Mama Twine line, which is very low grade. Um, and I think, I've sent on a correction, but I, I think the temperature range that they talk about is 200 to 450 degrees for the fluids. Remember, I work on coal. <laughs> so, okay. on behalf of Sasek, we okay. just have a small gift to. Oh, thanks very much. Thank you. So, this year, Sasek has been quite active, and we have a lot of events still planned. One of them being a drilling course this upcoming Saturday. So, look out and register for that. Then, if you we're interested in the Kalahari manganese field from Bruce's talk. We are hosting a field trip to visit some of the mines in September later this year. Thank you.